Oh, I know, this is absolutely insane. But on a side note, cash or for drugs, men would come and assault me over and over again. Top priority in this community is protecting the victims. And this was a human trafficking operation. Yes, these are real stories. Our team arrested 102 people. 95% of emergency room doctors and nurses never received training on the treatment of trafficking victims. Well, let's talk about it. You don't just treat your patient, you free them. Hey, Tiger friends, it's Meredith with Tiger Lily Resources, and we are here with an episode of Traffic Stop Side Notes. Today, we're going to be featuring Melanie Williams. She is the founder of Pursuit 3416, and I'm really excited to let her tell all about her ministry, what they're up against, what they do, and why they do it. So Tiger friends, sit tight and welcome in Melanie Williams. Hey, Melanie, how are you? I'm good. Just trying to battle the enemy as usual, but other than that, all is good. I hear you this week. Uh, for all of you who do not know, this is actually our take two because <laughs> the enemy was hard, hard at work. And that's when we know we are right over the target when he tries to interrupt and disrupt and distract every single possible thing he can, but he has no idea who he's up against. We are absolutely right. relentless and we don't quit. So we that's are right. on mission and on point to disrupt this evil that is in our world. So Melanie, please tell us all about your ministry, the who's, what's, when, where, why's, and how's. We are Pursuit 3416. And the reason we call ourselves that is because we are pursuing Ezekiel 3416, which is, I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak, but the sleek and the strong I will destroy. I will shepherd the flock with justice. We host free events to schools, churches, any organization basically that will have us. And we provide just an event and a presentation on what human trafficking looks like on a local demographic. So it's kind of how we differ from other ministries that might bring generic or basic human trafficking statistics. Where we differ is not only will we educate and inform on what trafficking looks like locally, we'll bring in local, real life, true stories as to how the youth or young adults, or all ages, honestly, sort of fell into human trafficking unknowingly. And we really um, are able to connect with the younger generation by sharing what that looks like and just giving very personal local stories. This ministry started about a year and a half ago, but truly the roots of it started around eight years ago. And how that came about was truly God breathed. I was watching a documentary or something and, and I was learning about human trafficking. I had a, a physical pull in my chest with, that I could only explain was the Holy Spirit literally just pulling me towards this information. And as I continued researching and, and trying to figure out what this looked like, I kept having that physical pull. I tried everything I could to get involved with local organizations to see how I could help being you know, a civilian. Would I have preferred to be part of a task force and go knock down doors a hundred percent, but with no military or law enforcement experience, I had to do the next best thing and figure out what can this person do? What can a civilian do to help stop this crime and the sin that's going on? So I got connected with an organization that has a restoration home and I eventually, um, I started out volunteering with them with basic stuff. And then I eventually became a life skills coach and a mentor to um, the kids that are in the restoration home. And I've been doing that for eight years. 
I then about a year and a half ago, I just had that call again where I needed to get in on the front end of this. I had spent eight years learning insider knowledge, hearing the stories of the kids I mentor, and just getting all kinds of tips that I needed to share so that I could make everybody aware of how this happens and how people fall into it and they don't even know it. They don't even know they're in it. They might think it's a boyfriend and I'll get into that later, but I had all this new information that I wanted to share. So I kind of became a one man band and I started doing events, putting together presentations that provided this information. Then at one of my events, I had another Holy Spirit experience where I had shared that uh, visceral reaction I had had eight years ago. And after the event, a lady came up to me and she said, I know what you're talking about. I have that feeling. I have that pull in my chest and I didn't know what it was. And she said, why isn't this in schools? I'm a substitute teacher at schools. And we started talking about that. And then we moved on. And about 10 minutes later, I came across uh, two more ladies. And they verbatim said the same thing. They said, we've had that chest pull. We want to know what that is. Why isn't this in schools? And sort of from that, Pursuit 3416 was born. Um, We became a ministry that solely exists to educate and empower and equip those to basically avoid getting involved with human trafficking. When you were doing the uh, kind of going back to your history and your mm-hmm. entrance into the knowledge of this, you were working in a residential program that was for children. Definitely for minors, so under 17 or under 18, basically minors of all ages that had been rescued from sex trafficking. And we're now living in this restoration home. With this, um, we really want to bring to light the realities and the trueness of Mm -hmm. of what human trafficking looks like in every nook and cranny of our country. You know, we do know it's a global issue, of course, but we kind of just shun away from the severity and the depth of what it is in our own backyard. You know, I've spoken times before in, you know, kind of suburban areas that Mm -hmm. feel you know, I know that they feel insulated from crime out in that area because it's just quiet and peaceful, but they don't realize that, you know, while they know trafficking happens in mm-hmm. cities and other cities and other states and other countries, they don't realize that what their precious little ones are holding in their hands is yeah. the fishing pole to these. And so just to bring like the reality to what does it look like for these, the kids that you have worked with? Is there something that's repetitive of a scenario or? So I would say about 80% of these kids, they're from middle-class families and they fell into sex trafficking through social media manipulation. And what that is basically, it can look a, a lot of different ways, but I would say the most common way is a trafficker or pimp contacts you through a direct message on a social media app and they present themselves as either a friend or a friend of a friend or maybe they're just getting on there telling you you're cute and they're trying to see if you bite i mean obviously they're not introducing themselves as a trafficker they're introducing themselves as just a regular person that thinks you're cute or maybe wants you to do some modeling work for them or or whatever the case. What ends up happening is these kids or the younger generation happens to adults as well. They just sort of get manipulated by these traffickers. Eventually they will think that through the grooming process, they don't know they're being groomed, but they are. And these traffickers are building relationships with them. They're building trust. And what's happening is They're just falling prey to trafficking and they have no clue. They will eventually meet their boyfriend or girlfriend once they feel safe and comfortable. And then from there, all sorts of things could happen. They could be trafficked 
while they're still living at home. They, they could be trafficked where they think they're in love with this boy or girl, and so they, they move in with them. It could be a hotel ring, a sex trafficking ring. In America, and especially like I'm looking at St. Louis specifically, it is not what you see on TV or the movie Taken. It is not kidnapping. Again, that happens. Don't get me wrong. It's it's just a smaller percentage. It's sort of a, I hate to say this, but a more innocent introduction into it. These people truly think that they have a relationship with these people and eventually they end up, you know, being trafficked, prostituted, um, whatever the case. Mm-hmm. So that's sort of the common denominator when it comes to what people don't expect. It's just some social media manipulation that ends up being sex trafficking. They lure them away. Grooming is becoming more of a common word now. It is. I love everything that's happening and, yeah. you know, with the schools and with the, the education topics that they're being brought in and mm-hmm. gender bending and all of this stuff. It's all that word is placed in all of those places. So what does grooming look like in the sense of sex trafficking? Grooming can happen a few different ways. When it's social media manipulation, they're DMing you and they're building a relationship. So they're building trust and they're becoming a confidant. They're becoming a boyfriend or a girlfriend. They're becoming someone that you depend on through the grooming process the trafficker is learning about you. They're very interested in you, asking loads of questions. And you're thinking, imagine um, a vulnerable teenage girl or boy that isn't getting a lot of attention at home or at school. And all of a sudden, someone is interested in them. They're giving them compliments. They're getting them affirmations that they've never gotten before. And they are swooning over this. Grooming is the whole process of building a relationship and building trust. That's kind of what it looks like when it's social media manipulation. It doesn't have to be on social media. It could definitely be where maybe you're a waitress at a club and one of the frequent clients at the club makes friends with you. And you get to a point where you trust this person because they're someone that comes in weekly and you guys chat and you build a relationship. And so whether it's in person or if it's online, you can see the commonality. It's always about building trust and building a relationship. Goodness, sex trafficking has so many layers to it and it looks so different in so many situations. This person at the club, I know personally these these stories firsthand. Maybe all of a sudden um, they go ahead and they fall in love and they trust them and the client, now trafficker, convinces them to leave their job and then eventually convinces them to sell their body for them. The outreach and awareness that you do with your ministry, what is your target audience and where do you typically speak at? Our target audience is anywhere there is the younger generation. It might be church youth groups. It might be schools. um, It might be clubs where the younger generation is part of. 13 is the most common trafficked age in the world. We want to get in with that younger population. We want to give them all these tips and all this insider knowledge that they can now be on the lookout for traffickers and they can identify a trafficker from just someone contacting them on the internet. We kind of go through details about how to identify the difference. That's sort of our target audience. However, we absolutely will come to organizations, businesses, if you have employee meetings, there's a whole load of adults and parents out there that You might have kids at home. You might have neighbors, nieces, nephews, grandkids. You may have no kids, but you're a human that cares about other humans. And if you are that, then you want to be able to learn what to look for out in the world. When we do a presentation for adults, 
we definitely cater it to that demographic. So our adult presentations are gonna look a lot different than our youth group presentations. Mm -hmm. We're gonna give different information. For instance, most parents, you know, they trust their kid and little do they know, but their kid is being enticed right in the back seat as they're driving to soccer practice. On that phone, my mom and dad are driving them to practice. Mm -hmm. They're on that phone in the DMs, building a relationship with a trafficker right in the back seat of the car or right in their bedroom, right under their nose. So many adults aren't aware of that and we make them aware and we give a lot of insider knowledge. coffee reach out and stop trafficking hand roasted artisan coffee made fresh with each online order visit the tiger lily website at www.tigerlilyresources.org that's t-i-g-e-r-l-i-l-i resources.org and visit the tiger store choose from the breakfast blend brazilian medium roast the bold colombian dark roast or go for all three with the variety pack choose whole bean or ground Every order helps women and children who are victims of sexual exploitation or human sex trafficking in the United States of America. Why would you drink any other coffee? I spoke at a, a men's breakfast not too long ago, probably about 80 men at church uh, men's breakfast. And I asked all of them, you know, raise your hand, whoever has, you know, a middle school, high school, daughter, niece, granddaughter, whatever, you know, and those people raise their hands. And I told them, I was like, gentlemen, you have permission to be the helicopter hover over that young person. Yes. And I can't tell you how many times I've had dads come up to me after and be like, man, thank you so much for that. I, I feel like I'm crowding my daughter and I want to give her her space and mm -hmm. I want to respect her boundaries, but it's just killing me. And I don't, you know, they're really kind of wrecked about it. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like if, if parents would take that stance of, especially, you know, while the children are in their homes, like you're still yes. parent. Yes. Be a parent over yes. your child. Know yes. what's going on. And, you know, it's one thing to know their face-to-face -face friends. Mm -hmm. but it's much more important to know who's in their hand. Right. When I do adult presentations, I'm always encouraging. They're not their kid's friend. And they don't need to be afraid of making their kid mad. <laughs> they are their protector. Yes. And right. what they're doing is they're doing their job. They are protecting them from the evils in the world. And if your kid has to get mad at you because you set boundaries and guidelines, yeah. so be it. Yeah. That's what being a parent is. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. It's yeah. okay. Do you guys do breakout sessions or anything like that or anything, a wrap up or anything? And Yes. Um, okay. So after every event, we open up a room so that people can come and they can get clarification. They can get direction. They can ask questions in private. It's anonymous. Um, sometimes if they need prayer, we're there to pray with them. Let me tell you, at every single event, there is a situation where we are able to squash trafficking in its tracks it, wow. at that moment because it never fails, especially when we're doing an event for the younger population. Someone comes into that room and they say, I think my best friend is being groomed after hearing what that truly looks like in all your examples. Right. I think, I think I might be being groomed or I think I was, what do I do now? And then we sit and we offer direction and next steps on how to handle it and what to do. And also I fully believe that's why the enemy causes a lot of problems and a lot of struggles in uh, our ministry and other ministries, because every single event that we conquer, 
we're preventing, we're stopping the grooming or the trolling. And yeah. so what's happening is we're able to help prevent it be from becoming official trafficking. If we can get to them while they're being trolled or groomed, we have stopped or, or prevented one less kid from being trafficked and, and being hurt. On the side of um, like when you get with them and you're, it, whether it's parents or children and they, they tell their story and they're like, well, what do I do now? How, is, how does collaborations work in your area? Do you have a lot of resources to share out? We do have a resources tab. And this tab are organizations that we've talked to or we've worked with. And it outlines what the situation might be. And then this will be the numbers that you should call or what you should do. We kind of direct them there. We also have the resource sheets available at events, so we can definitely just have it in hand if, if a situation has come up. There's difficulty. We've, we've had difficulty with the main 800 hotline, the human trafficking hotline. Yeah. We've had difficulty where we've directed people there and they haven't been able to get through. And, and that's disheartening because we've directed people there as a resource and right. It right. doesn't work out. So again, it's very tough. We then take different approaches and different routes, like possibly going local or local yeah. FBI, local police, et cetera. You're definitely not the only one that has mm -hmm. voiced that. And it is disheartening. Um, you know, in this sector, we teach everybody to call that. So it is very discouraging. So it's mm -hmm. awesome to see the local level. I think that we could do so much more, you know, and, and the issue is so large I think people look at it as so insurmountable. What do we do? What direction do we take? Yes. And they look at it as a whole national issue. But mm -hmm. if we can just finite it down into our own little areas, it's so yeah. much easier to tackle. And um, we're starting to take the approach, the very intentional approach of getting connected with the local sheriff's offices. A lot of them, I found they've had some really good training of mm -hmm. you know what to look for and what to do and. I've really been very excited about that kind of new discovery of okay. getting it local. And That's I love that you focus locally. So, okay, question about this too, since you are dealing locally, um, mm -hmm. what kind of demographics do you see like area-wise? Do you, do you come across more like rural, suburban, urban, like a mix of all? Like, is there, is there a target audience that trafficking goes for? Oh, goodness gracious. So the vulnerable is their target audience. Vulnerable. So that's going to be, it could be your kid um, on Snapchat sharing sad stories. Well, you've just done half the work for the trafficker because you're public and they've seen your sad story on Snapchat and now they know what tactics to use when they contact you. It could be that, it could be a vulnerable population like those that are having problems with gender identity. There's a lot of vulnerability in that area so they can get taken advantage of easily. Just broken homes, it's, it's, it's sad, but it's true. Again, they traffickers love when someone lives with one parent only, that's, less that they have to battle through. Right. So vulnerable is really what they're looking for. Now, I will say in typical middle-class areas, you're looking more at social media manipulation, but then you go out to rural areas and you're looking at more familial trafficking and friend to friend trafficking. Mm -hmm. So the familial trafficking is when a family member or someone you trust is your trafficker. Granted, all types of trafficking is in every area, but if we were going to break it down by rural versus uh, a dense suburban area, that's kind of what we're looking at. Friend-on-friend mm -hmm. -friend trafficking is becoming quite popular everywhere. Yeah. And it might look like you're in college and you're waitressing and you meet a really cool girl who's a bartender and this is actually a true story I'm using um, from a, a friend of mine that was a former trafficker and has been redeemed by Jesus, mm -hmm. praise God. She was that cool bartender and she made friends with the cute waitresses that were in college and she convinced them how to make a little money on the side. Sadly, some of these girls kind of had the attitude, you know, well, I'm giving away for free anyway. Why not make some money? 
they're sold on the fact that it's a job opportunity. And what they're obviously not being taught is that it is trafficking right. and they're committing all kinds of trauma for the future and um, a world of struggles for beyond that period in their life. Another example is the Jeffrey Epstein case. That was a really good example of how those two people manipulated teenagers out of Florida high school right. to then those friends traffic their friends. They were encouraged and they were paid bonuses by Ghislaine and Jeffrey. They sort of made the teenagers the traffickers right. by giving him, them these bonuses. Those kids then went and looked for the vulnerable yeah, yeah. girls that needed money and convinced them to ultimately be trafficked. They yeah. just didn't know because they didn't know that vocabulary. I actually lived in that area of Florida um, mm -hmm. where all of that happened at, and they targeted a lower income area of okay. Florida. Um, it was still Palm Beach County. Yeah, it was definitely, they knew who to target. They targeted right. the, the vulnerable. Again, they targeted the ones who exactly. could benefit from a mm -hmm. little sparkle of a little bit of extra cash and yeah. hanging out with pretty fancy people. What are ways that people can help you? What are ways that they can get involved? Okay. Um, what do you need right now? So first I want to address a comment you made earlier about how people will look at this and think it's so big and it's such a big scale crime. You know, how can little old me help? Every person in the ministry, whether you are working on our social media or you're calling, scheduling events, um, possibly you're a prayer partner, every single one of them even though their job specifically isn't down there busting down doors, it kind of is. Because if we didn't have all these members coming together so that we could get out there and mm -hmm. share all this insider knowledge and we could put together events, then all of those examples I gave of us stopping trafficking in its tracks at the events, they would never occur. You can... Just think of that whenever you're thinking, oh, I can't help. Who am I? No, you can help. You absolutely can help. So our ministry specifically would be prayer. Number one, if you could just pray for our ministry to yes. just defeat the enemy from yes. causing distraction and disorder and all the issues that mm -hmm. he is so good at causing and attempting to stop our events from happening. If you could pray against that, we yeah. would appreciate it so much. We are nonprofit. All these volunteers, they're, most of them work full-time and are full-time parents, yet they still find a little bit of time every week to put forth towards this ministry in order to fight human trafficking. We're Again, we're nonprofit and all of our marketing and our events and if we pay a speaker or anything, it comes out of our pocket. If you have um, a heart for funding, certainly on our website, there's opportunities to help fund, do fundraising and, and give to our organization. Specifically events. If you are affiliated with a youth group and a church, let us know. Get on our website. There is a form you can fill out and we will contact your youth pastor and we will provide an event. And again, for free, even if you're not affiliated with a church, maybe you are with a school, possibly an organization, and you have monthly employee meetings, mm -hmm. we'd love to come to a monthly employee meeting and just make everybody that we possibly can aware of what's happening right in their backyard, mm -hmm. in every single neighborhood in the world. And as I mentioned, it's happening in the backseat of your car. It's happening in your house and you don't know it. But nobody's going to know that if, if we can't get out there and share all this local info. Yeah, the realities of local. Yeah. yeah. So huge. Well, Melanie, I thank you so much for you. everything that you're doing. I thank you for taking time out of your day again. 
We will absolutely add your ministry to our prayer list. And I just, I want to pray now while we're here before we leave. So Please. Father God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, thank you so much for allowing us this time to come together. And thank you for stopping anything that the enemy tried to do to keep this from happening. It's clear that we're over the target and we will not stop. So thank you that you make a way when sometimes there just seems to be no way. And we know that this breaks your heart. These are your babies and you have empowered us and enlightened us and emboldened us to go and get your babies and, and keep them safe for you. And um, Father, we just were so honored that you trust us to do this. And I ask you specifically to bless Melanie and her family and her team of, of fighters. Um, they're definitely special people to step up and face this evil that is in our world right now. This is an evil like we have never, ever seen before. And to be able to shine the light on what this really is, the darkness can't overcome it. We will defeat this, Father, in your name and with your help. So I just lift up this ministry and I ask for just crazy, amazing blessings of provision and, and just favor over this ministry and that you walk and guide them through every single thing that they do. And just to be able to watch the victories that they achieve every time they open their mouths in your name. Mm -hmm. um, Father, we just ask that those words are just seasoned with salt and light and they are sweet as honey and they pierce through the hearts of those little ones so they understand what's happening and they run to safety. Mm -hmm. And in that, that they run to safety in your arms. So mm -hmm. Jesus, we just lift all of this up to you and it is in your precious and powerful name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that. And I just also wanted to say that this this couldn't happen without my awesome team. <laughs> I have uh, a great group of, of nine, um, just a small ministry and their heart. I couldn't ask for stronger hearts to fight this crime. And um, especially for our vice president, Kayla C. Fuentes, and our director of marketing, Abby Wilson, amongst all the other team members, just certainly could not do it without them. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Well, guys, I will put again, their website's going to be at the end of this and jump on their website and look around and get on the about page and learn about who they are and pray over every one of them. Their pictures are there. You can see who they are. You can see a little bit about them. There's ways to give. So just get involved. If you don't know where to start, start there, start with a prayer, just do something. We are called to action. Once we know the truth of a reality, we can no longer ignore it. You have to do something. So even if it is a prayer, that is actually the most powerful thing that you can do yes. against this is to pray. And if you're moved to give, give generously. We're going to wrap this up. And I thank you again, Melanie, so much. And friends, this is Meredith with Tiger Lily Resources. Mm -hmm. And I am signing off. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness is not over.